If you want to master curator rule building, this is a blog that you may appreciate taking a look at. It was written by Gladys Koskas and I will provide a link to this page on the video description. Let's go into the sections. She start by describing the difference between rules and building blocks. That's an interesting uh, differentiation. But then she addresses a topic that I have not seen anybody else address, which is uh, what rules are stateless and which rules are stateful. And that has importance uh, for the order in which the rules are evaluated. So sometimes, uh, and she put, puts here an example in which two rules, normally the rules are evaluated in the order that they appear. And if any one of the condition tested uh, false, then the rule evaluation stop. However, that's not the case when you have competing stateful and stateless rules. And she put a, a good example that uh, explained that difference. Subtle, but important. It may confuse you when you are writing uh, your, your rules. Also, she points out that when you want to see whether a particular uh, event is satisfying, when you are debugging the rules, making sure that everything works, when you you want to determine an event which rule it satisfies, uh, you go to this section. Let me actually show you that in my uh, demo system. So here I, we have some events, and, and we know that these events already contributed to an offense because of this icon in here. But when we open the actual event, and this happens with all the events in QReader, you have a section here that says which rule this particular event satisfies. Right? Here are the entire list of, the, of those rules. She then goes and explains that there are rules that fire on events, on flows, on both, and also ones that fire on the offenses. And this is this section here. And she also provides whether those are stateless or stateful. Now this is an interesting one, the negative case. Uh, where, where does this uh, actually comes from? If you are in the log activity tab or in the flows and you happen to, let me stop that, if you happen to go into a particular event and, and you go ahead and you click on here false positive, which is not something I would recommend doing by the way, but then this particular rule, this particular event will no longer uh, fire uh, any any offenses. And she explains that this is the, the, the list of which sync has been put for negative tests are the ones that get evaluated uh, first. That's not only valid for flows, but also for logs, but also for flows. You have that it in here. If we were to click in here, we will also have the same situation. Again, that confuse that can confuse people. Say, why is it my rule firing? Well, you may want to make sure that you you didn't you are not falling into that um, section on things that have been labeled as false positives. Now. Another topic that is very important is, well, most rules are global. When do I use global or local? Well, if you know that the event comes from a particular event processor, uh, the particular appliance per se, then you, you are better off going local and, and then have that, that rule being managed by that individual uh, processor rather than global, which is I'm going to evaluate in all the event processor. And this is particularly important when you have a large environment. You don't want to have, what, 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 why would you want to have rules that get evaluated on, a, on an appliance that will never see those type of uh, logs? So you may want to save resources for that. Then there is an important sec the section that she goes and the difference between rules action and rule responses. Let me actually go to the rules editor to show you those. If we go into any rule, and here are the test conditions, when we go to the next page, we have two set of uh, actions. These are the rules actions, and here are the rule responses. So here, the probably the most important one is how are you indexing the, 
the particular rule. So th as you can see, this rule is indexed by destination IP. Most of them are by source IP, but you have all sort of custom properties that you can group this by. What this means is that if new events come that satisfy rules and have the same destination IP, they will not fire a new offense, but they will be added to this particular offense that is already open. Uh, and then you can also set here the severity, credibility, and relevance. And this is actually very important, I forgot to mention. If you do not have this selected, this rule will not fire an offense. We'll do other things, but fire an offense will not be one of them. And then she moves into explaining uh, rule responses. Uh, whether you dispatch, this is very common, where you see all those events that are CRE events, those are because you have selected this option that fires an extra event uh, when, the, when the rule fire, and that one itself has its uh, own severity, credibility, and relevance. You put the category in there. Uh, and then you also, if you want this event that gets actually launched as a consequence of the offense to be also part of the offense, you will do so by selecting that here. And this is uh, an area that's always been, in the beginning was very obscure to me and probably still is, which is, okay, will this event uh, that triggers this offense, that, that matches all these rules, will be renaming the offense, will be modifying the actual name of the offense, and that's what this section is all about. But most importantly, what most people do in here, well, I want to do, uh, send an email when this offense fire, and I want to uh, execute a custom action and I have videos that show that, how you can write a Perl, typically a Python script that gets launched when these offense fire. And as a consequence of these things, it's very important to put a response limiter. So you, you, if you have multiple of these actually happening, you, you don't want to be sending, you know, 50 emails. Uh, you you want to send that, and so you want to limit those uh, by specifying uh, this response limiter. And of course, Here's where you select whether the rule is enabled or not. She goes here and explains in good detail the indexing, the rules, the patching new event, all these things is worth reading. I can assure you that. Now this is an interesting section in which she, she explains that when you modify a rule in Curator, First, first of all, you are not really modifying the original rule. The system automatically copies a uh, rule, takes your modification, and then if that rule gets updated by any auto updates or you update the package, whatever it is, Curator will respect and will not touch that rule because he said, "Well, the customer modified it, uh, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess with that one." There's also, you know, a user rule, which are not something that you specifically create. And Curator doesn't touch that because those are your rules. But on the existing one, that are there were system, but then becomes modified because you change them. Curator will not update those, so don't be surprised by that. However, you always have the possibility of hitting the revert rule, which will bring your rule back to the original state plus the changes that may have come through up to updates, etc. So you, if you are not happy with the way you modify a rule, you always have that revert rule. I, I think that the best action to take is to duplicate a rule, give it the name that you want, and then make all the changes that you want. I think it is a cleaner uh, way of approaching it. Always use the notes section uh, to explain what you did. And remember that in the use case manager app, where you can modify all your rules, you can even search by the stuff that you put on the notes. Then she talks about uh, using your resources efficiently, uh, we, in, in, which means she explains what uh, conditions or the test conditions are more expensive than others and what's the order to put them. So for example, if you have uh, an expensive rule that takes uh, regular expressions or AQLs or whatever it is, well, you don't want to put that test condition at the beginning that will be evaluated for every event that comes. You, for example, want to put a condition at the beginning and say, for Windows event logs only, then, you know, do the other condition, and then put the most expensive one to the end, because you know that if the ones on above it are false, anyone that becomes false, then the rule evaluation stops. So this is a way of saving resources. Again, great blog. I recommend you guys... Uh, taking a look at this to make sure that you master 
your skills in writing curator rules.